Hello, everyone, and welcome to Lab Manager's Tech Trends webinar series. My name is Trevor Henderson, Technology Editor for Lab Manager, and I'll be moderating today's discussion, which will focus on sample prep for mass spectrometry. We like our webinars to be very interactive, so we encourage you to send us your questions at any point during the presentation, and the panelists will address these in the Q&A session to follow. To ask a question, simply type your query into the Q&A box located at the bottom left-hand side of your screen, and we'll try to address as many of these questions as possible during the question and answer session. If we happen to run out of time, I'll forward any unanswered questions to the panelists and they can respond to you via email. Additional resources may be accessed via the file folder icon located at the bottom of your screen. You may also move or resize any of the windows simply by grabbing them at the top or stretching them at the bottom right corner. At this time, you may need to move or minimize some of the open windows to see the live view. This webinar recording will be available early next week on Lab Manager's website, and at the end of the webinar, we'll share that link with you, as well as the contact information for our panelists. With that, let me introduce our first speaker, Patrick Myers, who joins us today from Sigma Aldrich Sapelco. After spending three years in the molecular and cell biology program at Pennsylvania State University, Pat received a Bachelor of Science degree in biochemistry and biophysics from the University of Pittsburgh. He worked as an industrial hygienist before entering graduate school at Duquesne University. While at Duquesne, Pat worked uh, in the regulatory affairs departments of various corporations, including Alcoa, Arista Chemical, Calgon Corporation, Fisher Scientific, and Coppers. Research into the use of activated charcoal ad adsorbents in clinical toxicology led to a master's of science degree in pharmacology and toxicology. Pat did ex extensive additional research into the neurophysiology of Alzheimer's disease and other dementia disorders before becoming an instructor at Mount Eliosis College for five years. Pat began his career at Sigma Aldrich Sapelco in 2000 as a technical service chemist providing practical advice to customers in the choice and use of products to enable their success. In 2007, saw a move to the Research and Development Group, where Pat is currently a Senior Research and Development Scientist in the Sample Preparation Group. His area of specialization include catchers and solid phase extraction. Thank you for joining us today, Pat. Thank you, Trevor. As Trevor said, my name is Pat Myers, and I am with Sapelco, a division of Sigma Aldrich, and we are the chromatographic division of Sigma Aldrich. We provide analytical tools and solutions that are used in scientific research, quality control, and manufacturing in the healthcare, food, environmental, chemical, and energy markets. And today we're going to talk about purifying biological samples for small molecule analysis. So, analyzing small molecules present in biological matrices like blood, serum, or plasma is a challenge. These matrices contain proteins, phospholipids, and other components that interfere with analytical techniques, especially mass spectrometry. I will present information today on two solutions that are generally applicable to the cleanup of biological matrices prior to mass spec analysis. These are hybrid SPE phospholipid technology and the Sapel Select polymeric SPE materials. We'll start with the phospholipids. Phospholipids are found in all cells and are a major component of the cell membrane. Because of this, they are found in blood, but also serum and plasma samples. And because of their function in membranes, they have a hydrophilic component and a hydrophobic component, which makes them difficult to extract using conventional methods. Additionally, they are present in variable amounts in different matrices and even in different samples within the same matrix. So how do phospholipids impact LCMS analysis? First, because of the variability in concentration, they negatively impact accuracy and reproducibility. This is because they often co-elute with analytes of interest and are ionized along with the analyte. As you can see from this example, the 
the signal for clonidine was suppressed by the presence of phospholipids in the rat plasma. Differing amounts of phospholipid would vary the amount of suppression, preventing accurate measurement. So how does the hybrid SPE phospholipid material work? The surface of the silica-based packing material is bonded with zirconia. Zirconium atom acts as a Lewis acid or electron acceptor because of its empty d orbitals. This specifically retains the Lewis base phosphate group of the phospholipid, completely removing them from the sample. In addition to removing phospholipids from the matrix, proteins are precipitated, removing them from the sample as well. The importance of this can be seen here. Without sample cleanup, both the back pressure and the baseline are increased after multiple injections. As you can see from the first injection, our back pressure is 2,020 PSI, and after 20 injections goes up to 2,150 PSI. And you can also see that the, the background or the baseline increases dramatically from the first to the 20th injection. And these are monitoring for phospholipids at um, a 184 mass to charge ratio. Now, to prevent this from happening, you would generally have to do some sort of gradient at the end of your run to clean off some of these proteins. And as you know, if you increase each run, you increase the length of your sequence mm -hmm. and decrease your throughput. So how can we fix this? Well, following a standard sample prep, as shown on the slide, um, using uh, the hybrid SPE phospholipid 96 well plate, uh, you can see there is no increase in back pressure and no carryover of phospholipids, eliminating the need for the cleaning gradient uh, at the end of each run. Um, so the initial back pressure is 1920 PSI. It only increases to 1925 PSI after 20 injections. And there is little, if any, increase in the background baseline. Phospholipid material is available in both 96 well format and traditional SPE tubes. In the 96 well format, the bed is contained by a 0.2 micron filter frit on the bottom and a PTFE or Teflon frit on the top. The top frit allows on plate protein precipitation because it diminishes the amount of analyte or solvent that goes through the frit while you do the precipitation. And then the bottom frit yields an ultra clean sample that's ready for analysis. The generic method for processing most biological samples using the hybrid SPE phospholipid material is really simple. You just precipitate proteins by adding 300 microliters of a 1% formic acid solution to 100 microliters of sample in each well. Then you mix the sample and the precipitating solution by vortexing. You then apply a vacuum to pull the sample through the bed, filtering the proteins and retaining the phospholipids. And then the resulting filtrate is now free of proteins, phospholipids, and is ready for analysis or concentration if required. So the hybrid SPE phospholipid method merges both protein precipitation and phospholipid removal in a simple process requiring little to no method validation or development. So let's move on to polymeric SPE. First, 
what is polymeric SPE and why is it important? Traditional SPE materials are composed of a phase bonded onto a silica-based particle. The most common phase is a C18 reverse phase. One of the biggest issues with using reverse phase SPE is the necessity of method development because of the strongly hydrophobic nature of the C18 phase. Polymeric SPE phases, on the other hand, retain a broad range of organic compounds from aqueous matrices. This makes method development easy. In most cases, a generic method works well. Additionally, there are thousands of references in the literature using polymeric SPE materials. This makes finding an appropriate method easier if you need help in method development. So polymeric chromatographic material are typically made up of a hydrophobic polystyrene backbone which is modified by adding hydrophilic groups like possibly N-vinyl pyrrolidine or methacrylate or some other compound. Our HLB material provides both reverse phase retention and hydrophilic retention of more polar compounds. The ion exchange phases maintain the reverse phase interactions and the hydrophilic type interactions, but they add specificity for either anions with the SAX or cations with the SCX. And as you can see, this material has a wide pH compatibility of the entire pH range. Particle size is 50 to 70 microns, surface area ranges from 180 to 420 meters squared per gram, and the pore size is 80 to 200 angstroms. So now let's look at a specific example using the Sapel Select SCX material, isolating illicit bath salts from urine for LCMS analysis. There are multiple compounds in this class of drugs, including three sets of isobaric compounds, and these require chromatographic separation as well as the MS for positive confirmation. And the structures of some of these bath salts can be seen here. In preparation for a helic chromatographic separation and time of flight MS detection, the analytes were retained via ion exchange on an SCX polymeric SPE phase. A wash with an acidified high organic washed off endogenous matrix components and elution using a strongly basic organic solvent resulted in a highly clean sample. So in this case, more specifically, a 1 ml urine spiked with 100 microliter, or 100 nanograms per mil, sorry, of the bath salts was applied to a Sapel Select SCX tube, and 1 milliliter of water was used to wash off it. And then 1 milliliter of 1% formic acid in acetonitrile followed by another 1 ml water was used to wash off any endogenous materials from the urine. And then elution was accomplished using 2 milliliters of a 10% ammonium hydroxide solution in acetonitrile. The subsequent analysis of this material showed a very clean sample with really good peak shapes, um, as can be seen in the chromatogram. And if you look at the diluted spiked urine, you can see extensive matrix, matrix interference 
while the blank urine con cleaned with the same process as the, sa the sample showed the elimination of the matrix component. So the diluted spiked urine sample was in the red trace here, and then the blank cleaned urine was in the blue trace. So analysis of the clean sample yielded percent recovery of all compounds greater than 75%. But this was not the case with the non-cleaned or spiked urine. As you can see, one of the recoveries is as low as 43.7%. So the Sapel Select SCX SPE tube allowed for efficient removal of the matrix components of urine and provided high analyte recovery. So polymeric SPE is a valuable addition to your sample preparation methodologies. It can provide retention of a broad range of analytes from aqueous matrices with little or no method development. So in conclusion, hybrid SPE phospholipid technology allows the simultaneous precipitation of proteins and removal of phospholipids from biological matrices. This enables highly accurate and reproducible analyses, shorter run times, and less downtime due to cleaning gradients. And using polymeric SPE phases enables the application of generic extraction methods and simple elution procedures to a broad range of organic compounds in aqueous matrices. Thank you, and I'll turn it back over to Trevor. Uh, thank you, Pat, and thank you all for sending in your questions. I encourage you to continue to do so throughout the presentations, and if you joined us late, you can ask questions simply by typing your query into the question box, which is located at the bottom left-hand side of your screen. Our next speaker today is Dr. Mike Kowalski, who joins us from Beckman Coulter. Mike is a staff application scientist in the Sample Preparations and Applied Markets group of Beckman Coulter Life Sciences. He received his PhD in microbiology and molecular genetics from Harvard University. And prior to joining Beckman, Mike was a postdoctoral fellow at the Novartis Institutes for Biomedical Research, where he used automation to screen for novel regulators of stem cell pluripotency and differentiation. Since joining Beckman, Mike has developed automated applications in the areas of cell culture, cellular analysis, and mass spectrometry. Welcome, Mike. Thanks, Trevor, and thanks, everyone, for attending today. I'll be talking a little bit about some of our automated solutions for mass spectrometry sample prep. Uh, just a brief overview of what we'll be covering today. Sorry, there's a bit of a lag on my side, but there we go. Looks like uh, the slide should be up now. So what we'll be talking about is just briefly why people typically automate their workflows, and in particular why someone might automate mass spec applications. I'll give a brief introduction to the Biomech workstations, the three different uh, sizes of which are shown below, with increasing capacity from left to right is the Biomech 4000, the NXP, and the FXP. I'll uh, refer to those in, uh, throughout the slides. And then finally, we'll talk about some specific automated solutions for mass spectrometry sample prep that we've developed in-house. So as to typical reasons why people automate applications, usually comes down to one or both of two reasons. The first is repeatability. Uh, so automation can certainly help by improving the accuracy and precision of a given liquid transfer step or a given protocol. And in addition, by relying on automation, you can actually remove the user-to-user -user variability that's always inherent when multiple people are performing the same application. And finally, we're all prone to errors, so by relying on automation and reducing the number of human interactions, that can certainly lead to reducing errors in sample prep. In addition, uh, it can typically, automation can help free up resources. Uh, obviously, if you have a very time-consuming workflow or a very complex workflow, it can certainly chain us to the bench, and I think a, a number of us feel that our, our time is better spent either designing experiments or analyzing results rather than uh, performing bench work. 
In addition, even if you have a simple workflow, if you have a high enough throughput, this can still become a time-consuming endeavor, and so again, better, be, uh, better it be left to automation. And one consideration when thinking about automation is whether it makes more sense to have automation be designed for a single fixed purpose, or if it makes more sense to have a more flexible platform that can be used for a variety of applications. And Beckman Coulter certainly comes down on the side of flexibility. So as far as why uh, would someone automate mass spec sample prep, uh, again, same reasons apply, but for repeatability, obviously, uh, if you, you want ideal precision and, and accuracy, because improved accuracy can make sure that your crucial samples are analyzed correctly and that you are achieving the correct result. In addition, both through improved precision as well as removing the user-to-user -user variability, this can help essentially shrink your error bars and so this can allow you to detect smaller differences between samples, essentially lowering your limit of quantification. Finally, uh, if you reduce the errors, that's obviously going to reduce the number of retests that are required, and this can help lead to either faster discoveries or increased uh, throughput in sample prep. Uh, in addition, when it comes to freeing up resources, obviously mass spec is becoming more and more adopted uh, as an analysis of choice in a variety of fields, and this will, of course, uh, result in increased throughput for a variety of samples. In addition, a number of labs have multiple mass spec instruments, and this can quickly push the sample bottleneck uh, into the sample prep stage. And finally, when it comes to, again, choosing between a fixed purpose or more of a flexible system, obviously the more applications that are uh, developed for mass spec, the more flexibility that is required in a sample prep uh, instrument. And so, again, uh, a reason why automation uh, should be flexible, ideally. So a little more information on the Biomec. Uh, so there's basically, I mentioned the three different versions, the Biomec 4000, the Biomec NX, and the Biomec FX. Uh, they're basically, the main difference is the way in which they are pipetting. So the Biomec 4000 can switch tools between a single channel and an eight channel uh, tool to essentially recreate what we would do at the bench with just handheld pi pipetters. The Biomec NXP has a span eight system, which is shown to the right. And this allows the pipet pipetting tools, the probes, to actually spread out so that multiple tubes can be accessed at once and thereby increase throughput. And alternatively, the NX can also come with a 96-channel or 384 multi-channel head instead of the Span 8 pipetter, uh, which was shown on the previous slide. And the Biomech FX has the capacity for both the Span 8 and the multi-channel head. So again, more complex workflows can be performed on this instrument. All three share the same intuitive software. Uh, basically, methods are developed by dragging and dropping steps into a method. And you can either use the default settings, or you can really drill down and have fine control of a given step uh, when needed. So essentially, you can control where within the well the pipette tips are currently residing, how slow or fast to aspirate or dispense the liquids, if you want a tip touch on the side, etc. So again, anything you can do manually, you can typically recreate on the automated system. And it's also worth mentioning that data is tracked throughout the, the method. So if barcode information, for example, is uh, located for each sample on a given plate, that information will be transferred to the final destination along with any of the volumes. So essentially that, that data is tracked throughout. And I've mentioned a number of times that Biomex are designed to be flexible. So this also uh, includes the ability to integrate different devices. And this can be on the deck of the instrument, such as heating or cooling positions, or plate shakers or plate tilters as well as off-deck in, uh, integrations for additional instruments that can either sit next to the instrument or can actually be collected through conveyors. And those uh, instruments can be such things as analyzers, incubators, or plate storage. So again, increasing either the complexity of workflows that can be uh, presented or the percentage of a workflow that is automated. So moving more specifically to mass spectrometry automation, uh, I mentioned before that mass spec is obviously growing as an analytical tool in a variety of areas, and we'll touch on applications that we've developed in a number of different of those areas, including uh, forensics, clinical research, biomarker discovery, and biologics analysis. And obviously, Beckman Coulter is not a mass spectrometry company, so obviously it's key that we develop uh, these solutions with various partners. And one of our main collaborators is Cyx, which we have the advantage of having it be a sister company under the Danaher umbrella. But we also have a number of uh, other collaborators who are doing the actual science, including Vision Laboratories and Cedar sinai Medical Center, uh, whose data we'll be showing today. 
So the first example is a forensic application, and this was work that was done on the Biomech 4000, so again, the, the lowest complexity instrument we have. Uh, and this was, uh, our collaborator had developed a mass spec panel to study 56 pharmaceutical and illicit drugs for drug monitoring, uh, and he was studying uh, these compounds in urine samples. And the workflow that he had uh, derived was shown to the right, where samples are basically uh, transferred to a 96-well plate, uh, combined with buffer and beta-glucuronidase, and then they're currently taken offline for a heating step for two hours. And I've mentioned that we do have the capability of heating this on the deck, but because he's, it would essentially hold in position for two hours, he's able to actually process more samples by taking the step offline. The plate is then returned to the uh, instrument where internal standard and diluent are added, a off-deck centrifuge step, and then uh, the samples are returned and transferred, the supernatants are transferred to a clean plate for LCMS analysis. Uh, shown to the left are just two of the 56 compounds shown with a standard curve. And again, just showing excellent linearity, but since we can't show you all 56 curves, the chart in the center basically gives you an idea of the average accuracy and average CVs that he was able to obtain across all 56 compounds, and looking anywhere from 0.5 to 10-fold cutoff value. And what you can see is excellent accuracy in CVs, where uh, CVs are less than 10%, except at the very lowest level, where it's at 10.7% on average. And the processing of a full plate of 96 samples and QC controls uh, takes about three hours, again, mostly due to just that initial heating step. We'll now move into the clinical research uh, focus, where, again, a common application in this is doing vitamin D analysis. And so the goal here was to extract vitamin D2 and D3 from serum samples. And we actually went about this uh, two different ways. This was in collaboration with Cyx, and the initial approach we took was a standard liquid-liquid extraction using hexane, and that workflow is shown on the right half, uh, but on the left-hand side. Again, samples were actually transferred to uh, micro-centrifuge tubes for processing for a variety of reasons, including the need to uh, achieve higher centrifugation speeds, as well as some compatibility issues with hexane with a variety of 96-well plates. So the samples were transferred to tubes, internal standard and hexane was added, and then the samples were taken offline for centrifugation and a microcentrifuge. The top layer was then uh, transferred using the automation to clean tubes, and the samples were then dried down and resuspended, and occasionally sonication was required to make sure that uh, resuspension was complete. Samples were then transferred to an HPLC vial for analysis. And what you can tell from this workflow is that it's obviously not very automation friendly in the sense of there's many interactions and many offline steps. So we worked with our, our collaborators at SIAC to uh, automate a salt-assisted liquid-liquid extraction using zinc sulfate, and that is shown on the far right. And you can quickly see it's a much uh, more simple and more automation-friendly step, where samples are actually, in this case, transferred to a 96-well plate, internal standard and zinc sulfate are added, and then a centrifugation step is required, but this can actually be automated as well because we can uh, integrate centrifuges that can spin 96-well um, plates, as well as tubes. But uh, this was achievable at the required speed. The samples were then returned to the deck, and the supernatant was transferred to a clean plate for LCMS analysis. And again, shown on the left is just a nice linear standard curve uh, with the vitamin D3. And really the equivalent here is, uh, is shown at the bottom in the chart, showing that hexane and zinc sulfate, we were able to achieve excellent results with both, um, and roughly equivalent results. But obviously, again, the uh, salt-assisted method was much simpler and more automation-friendly, and you could process 96 samples in about 75 minutes. So now we'll move more into the proteomics area. Uh, thinking more specifically about biomarkers. And the goal for this particular workflow was to digest complex proteomic samples. Uh, and in this case, we were starting with serum samples, but this could also be applied to possibly cell culture samples, et cetera. And again, the workflow is shown to the right. And this was basically, uh, again, being processed in a 96-well plate. And this work was done on the Biomec NXP, as was the vitamin D, so essentially the, the middle-sized uh, instrument. And samples, one of the tricks of this uh, sample prep is that these are all very small volumes other than the buffer. So every volume that we were transferring was between 2 and 5 microliters. So again, something that's challenging to achieve manually. Uh, so samples were added to a plate. And this could also, the method's been written so that if you want to test repeatability, a single sample can be added to multiple wells. Uh, buffer and internal standard are, uh, uh, buffer is added and internal standard is added optionally, followed by the addition of a denaturant and reducing agent. 
And again, we uh, require a heating step, which again, this was currently taken offline for uh, increasing throughput, but again, we have the capabilities to do this online. Uh, the samples are then returned and added, uh, mixed with an alkylating agent, more buffer, and a trypsin uh, reagent, and then heated for three hours, again, taken off deck, because again, that would uh, essentially tie up the instrument for three hours. So then uh, it's returned and a quench buffer is added. So the full process takes about six hours, again, due to over four hours of incubations. And uh, this was initially tested for biomarker quantification. And this was work that we did with our collaborators at Cedar sinai where they were most curious about uh, trying to increase their throughput looking at a single uh, biomarker. And so the internal standard was added, and they looked at peak area ratio and found that they had excellent rep reproducibility around CV around 3%. However, we also wanted to see if this could be applied more generally to biomarker identification, where you may not necessarily have a known protein of interest and a known internal standard. So for this, our collaborators at SciX performed swath analysis on 130 peptides from serum samples. And what they found was that this was a broadly applicable digest procedure in which 85% of the peptides they studied had CVs uh, below 10% for the peak area. And keep in mind, this is not peak area ratio, so there was no normalization to internal standard. They actually took it one step further and tested the automated protocol on different days and also sent the method to our collaborators at Cedar sinai to see how reproducible it was at a second site. And what they found is excellent reproducibility across both instruments on multiple days where we consistently had 85% of the, the uh, peptides showing CVs less than 10% for uh, peak area variability. So the final example I'll talk about today is the Biologics Bioanalysis, or the BioBA solution that uh, SciX launched at ASMS. And this is basically a complete uh, reagent to analysis workflow of which automation is uh, a part of uh, that SciX has released as a way to essentially help people transition from analyzing small molecules to larger biologic molecules. And the, the particular goal of this kit that they launched was to capture and digest human IgG from preclinical uh, animal uh, serum. And in this case that we tested, we used rat serums that had been spiked with Silomab and Silolite reagents. And what you can see from the workflow on the right is that, again, essentially it's all blue. We've automated the entire workflow. And because of this more complex workflow, uh, it, we, w we did choose to automate it on the Biomech FXP, uh, so the, the highest capacity instrument we have. So in this case, samples are combined with internal standard, and then they are added with a magnetic bead that is streptavid encoded and basically has uh, antibodies coded on the beads that are targeting the FC region of human IgG. And these beads were developed by Promega and part of a SciX reagent kit. Uh, after the beads have incubated with the samples, they're washed three times and eluted. And the eluate is then denatured, reduced, alkylated, and digested in a similar fashion to what I described previously, but different reagents are used. Uh, finally, the samples are then transferred to a clean plate for LCMS analysis. And what you can see from the graph in the middle is that we were able to achieve peak area ratios with CVs of around 6.5%, uh, which is pretty exceptional considering 4.5% of that came uh, simply from the variability in the LCMS alone suggesting that the automated uh, and very complex workflow only added an additional 2% variability during sample prep. And this is due in part because of the significant amount of optimization that went into not only the automation, but also the choosing the reagents as well as choosing labware that was compatible with both the reagents and the magnetic posts and the heating element on the instrument, et cetera. So a very well, uh, well optimized system. So with that, uh, there's some final considerations as well. These are just some examples of more specific workflows, but there's some more general workflows that are both upstream and downstream to be considered. Uh, the first being the upstream idea of either transferring samples from tubes into plates or even aliquoting samples, which is something that's not very complex, but certainly can be very time consuming for people. And this is, again, something that could be very quickly automated on one of these systems. And also, as far as downstream, a number of the proteomics applications would typically require desalting, such as using SPE. Uh, however, the BioBase reagents actually don't require desalting, but the protein digest uh, workflow does. But what our collaborators at Cedar sinai found out is that uh, even when performed manually, their SPE uh, dry down and resuspension contributed significant variability to their results. And so they actually moved to more of an online desalting step on the LCMS, where the salt fraction was diverted to waste uh, prior to the introduction onto the mass spec. 
And finally, we do have some additional uh, work in development, uh, looking at additional immuno enrichment methods, as well as cis kappa methods, where the uh, peptides are immunoprecipitated following protein digest. And those will be developed on the Biomech NX platform. So with that, I'd just like to wrap up, and hopefully I've shown you that there are some benefits to automation, and in particular for mass spec applications. Uh, we already have a number of mass spec applications that have been developed for a variety of areas, and that's due in large part due to our partnerships, uh, where our collaborators can bring their scientific and reagent and analysis expertise, and we can provide the automation uh, component. And of course, uh, again, the four workflows I've described today uh, may not be exactly what you're currently doing, but the instruments are designed to have the flexibility for either novel or customized applications uh, to be developed for a given lab. So with that, I'd just like to thank all my collaborators, uh, certainly our collaborators at SciX, at ProMega, at Cedars-Sinai, and at Vision Laboratories, as well as my colleagues at Beckman Coulter, who are all essential for the data I've shown today. And finally, uh, there is some additional information. Obviously, I've only touched on some of the workflows, uh, but for more information about the reagents or the protocols themselves, or even the L LCMS protocols, as well as additional data, uh, this uh, URL is also available in the resource area. So with that, thank you, and I think we're ready for questions. Great. Thank you very much, Mike. And uh, yes, we will uh, move straight into our question and answer session. Uh, I have a number of questions that have come in from our audience. Uh, and Pat, if you've joined us again, maybe I'll direct the first question at you. Um, Pat, is there a particular type of uh, SP that you would recommend for cleanup of plant material for the detection of pesticides? Well, some of that depends on what plant material it is. If it's something that has a lot of chlorophyll, then you need to have a graphitized carbon black to remove the chlorophyll. If it, if it doesn't have chlorophyll, um, then you know, a normal catcher's SP tube would, would or sorry, a normal catcher's tube would be fine. Um, the only issue you have with the graphitized carbon black is they tend to grab onto the planar pesticides. So you have to be careful about your um, what pesticides you're analyzing also. Great, thank you. Uh, now, Mike, you uh, you mentioned your partnership with uh, with SciX. Are these applications limited to the SciX uh, mass spectrometers? Uh, not certainly no. Uh, basically, a lot of the work we've done has either involved around SciX uh, chemistries as well as analyzed on SciX mass spectrometers. But it should be applicable broadly. And again, like I mentioned, it's very easy to customize some of these methods. That again, some changes may be required. Uh, for example, if your LC it does or does not take plates, for example. Uh, the methods may be written to finish up in plates, but we could certainly alter those methods to finish up uh, in HPLC vials. And in addition, uh, I didn't really go into this, but we actually, the automated methods can often be developed to basically spit out data files that can automatically be imported into a variety of uh, softwares. So we may have written it to work with the analyst software for SciX, but depending on the uh, type of uh, uh, Excel file, et cetera, that might be used for a different mass spec. It certainly would not be difficult to customize those uh, for other manufacturers of, uh, of LCMS systems. Hey, thank you. Uh, now, Pat, uh, what is the minimum plasma volume that can be used uh, with the hybrid SP technology you spoke of? Um, well, the the plate that that I mentioned today is. Um, it's generally 150 microliters. We do have one that can go down um, lower than that. It's a low volume plate, and that can go down to, I believe, 25 microliters. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, Mike, how do you deal with hazardous samples or reagents uh, when using automation? Oh, that's a good question, and th that can actually vary depending on the instrument that we're using. For example, the Biomech 4000 can fit into a standard laminar flow hood, so that might be one way to deal with uh, potential hazardous uh, either samples or reagents. Um, alternatively, we frequently will develop custom enclosures that can either be like a HEPA filtered enclosure for if, if it's just to protect from biologics, but also it can be something that's vented uh, in, case of, in the case of, say, working with hexane, where you don't necessarily want the volatile chemical just sitting out on the bench top. So definitely have ways of dealing with both of those. Okay, thank you. 
Now, Pat, are there any uh, FP methods that can be used for peptide purification? Yeah, there there are generally applicable applicable SPE methods for peptide purification. They generally involve using either a, a C18 or a C8 SPE material, depending on the, the size and complexity of the peptides. Okay, thank you. Now, uh, also, Pat, uh, is there any solution uh, if your analyte of interest is not uh, soluble in acetonitrile? Yes, other other solvents can be used. Um, some people use um, acetone in the these methods. Um, uh, methanol can be used. Um, generally, there you use some sort of um, water miscible solvent, though. Great, thank you. Now, uh, Mike, could you uh, uh, discuss how sample practice? Workflows are automated for a specific lab. Sure, and and I, I think I've kind of already touched on this a little bit, but basically, uh, let's just say it was a completely novel uh, workflow that we haven't necessarily automated in house or with our collaborators. Um, basically, the process would begin by uh, meeting with our automation sales representatives as well as our uh, field application scientists to discuss what the workflow is, what the required throughput is, to try and figure out which of the instruments it would fit best on, and what of the additional integrations might be required uh, to automate the workflow. And then basically, uh, uh, upon delivering an instrument to a new lab, there's uh, some basic training, but also we, we have customers who are either more interested in developing their own applications, in which case we have additional training courses, and we have other customers who are more interested in just really hitting the go button, in which case we have our field application scientists can actually do the development for them. So uh, we've got a variety of different ways to uh, develop a, a novel application. Thank you. <clears throat> now, uh, Pat, are there any uh, methods you could recommend to increase assay sensitivity? Well, the assay sensitivity um, really revolves around the analytical aspect of it, um, and you know the the catcher's methods don't really address the sensitivity part. Uh, you can once you get to the end, you can as I talked about, concentrate the samples. They're clean enough that you don't have to worry about any other contaminants, so you can concentrate, reconstitute at a lower volume, which would increase your sensitivity. Hey, thank you. And uh, Mike, can the Biomech be integrated to an LCMS system? Uh, that's a good question. So uh, we've certainly looked at that a number of times. Uh, in general, the, the short answer is not easily, uh, simply due to there's both a, a hardware and a software component uh, to integrations. And a lot of the LC manufacturers have not obviously developed with uh, automation in mind. So it's very often a, a manually open door or a manually pushed in uh, stage, things like that. Uh, but we have kicked the tires on a number of these. Uh, and there are some systems that we're working on that are larger systems, so maybe multiple LCMSs on a line, and different samples can go to different LCs. But typically, I think, depending on the throughput, it's often just not cost effective compared to just having someone come in and pick up a plate that's already been processed and move it to an LCMS. So uh, certainly things are possible, um, but in general, like I said, it's not necessarily something that's frequently done just due to the fact that, uh, again, it may not necessarily save a lot of manual work time. Very well, thank you very much, and uh, I thank you both for the discussion. We've reached the end of our questions, uh, so this brings us to the end of today's webinar. Uh, if you have any further questions, please consider reaching out to uh, either Pat or Mike uh, directly. Their emails, as you can see, are available on the screen now. And just a reminder that today's webinar vid uh, video will be available at the link you see on the screen. On behalf of Lab Manager, I'd like to thank our panelists today for the hard work they put into their presentations. And I'd also like to thank our sponsors, Sigma Aldrich, Sapelko, and Beckman Coulter for supporting our Tech Trends webinar series.
As well, I'd like to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us today. Please mark your calendar for our next Tech Trends webinar, which will focus on analytical chemistry techniques. This webinar will be taking place Thursday, August 6th, from noon until 1.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. For more information on this and other Lab Manager webinars, please visit our website at www.labmanager.com. We hope you can join us again next time. Thank you, and have a great day.